that the outstanding local authorities who remain to conclude these matters will do so as quickly as possible. Thank you. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Jackie Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And with your permission, I would like to first pay tribute to Joanne Lamont. I know that members right across this chamber recognise Joanne's passion and commitment to making Scotland a better place. And indeed, all of her life, she has she's been motivated by the desire to achieve social justice and tackle inequality. And that's something I know she will continue to do with the many friends and colleagues across this chamber towards that goal. Can I also thank her for her notable achievements as leader. Um, amongst them, one of my personal highlights, which was securing um, the control of Glasgow City Council against expectation, and of course, the most recent, very successful referendum campaign result. Can I wish her well for the future? <laughs> to ask the Minister what engagements he has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland, but this is my first parliamentary opportunity, so I would like to pay tribute to Joanne Lamont uh, for following her stepping down as leader of the Labour Party at the weekend. Uh, I have always found Joanne Lamont to be a, a spirited opponent in the, the Scottish Parliament, strongly dedicated to her party, but in particular her championing of, of key issues, uh, such as the eradication of child poverty uh, and support for carers. Uh, I have got absolutely no doubt that uh, she will continue to play a uh, an active role in Scottish public life, and I wish her well for the future. Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the First Minister for his kind comments? We all care passionately about our NHS. We value the work our NHS staff do every single day. So today's Audit Scotland report makes grim reading. Progress has been slow, significant change is needed, little planning um, in evidence, services at risk, targets missed and budgets squeezed. Does the First Minister have a plan, any plan at all, to deal with the growing crisis in the NHS? First Minister. Well, I, I think we should uh, start by looking at the Audit Scotland report uh, and looking at where the Audit Scotland uh, identified substantial progress quote, in a number of areas, including improving outcomes for people with cancer or heart disease, reducing health care associated infections. Uh, patient satisfaction of hospital inpatient service has increased since 2012. Waiting time targets have been reduced over the last 10 years. The length of time that people have to wait has decreased considerably. And between 2003 and 2012, the death rate from all forms of heart disease fell by 38%. Uh, and on we go in that report to identify where the National Health Service has made substantial progress. Uh, of course, it is true, and quite rightly, that Audit Scotland draws attention to the fact that despite the success of our NHS in terms of managing its finances, a uh, success which has not been replicated elsewhere uh, in either England or Wales, uh, that nonetheless the uh, National Health Service faces challenges for the future. How could it be otherwise? in the current situation. So perhaps Jackie Bailey should have paid close attention to page 32 of Audit Scotland report. Reductions in spending at a UK level will affect the level of funding available in Scotland. The Scottish Government will need to plan for health spending within an overall reducing budget. The very heart of the financial challenge facing our National Health Service a retrenchment and austerity at UK level and the financial pressures that imposes on our National Health Service in Scotland. Jackie Bailey. Ms Bailey. The First Minister is um, you, consistent in his fondness of selective quoting, um, but can I say to him, the report overall makes extremely grim reading. Presiding officer, we know that the answer we've just received is not the answer of a First Minister in control. It's the answer of a First Minister in absolute denial. Anybody watching... Anybody watching who works in the NHS knows the pressures on the health service. They won't be convinced, convinced by his bluff and bluster. Let's look at the reality of the NHS under the SNP. Almost half a million hospital days lost to delayed discharge. Half a million hospital days. One in four patients in hospital who don't need to be there. 325 consultant vacancies up 60% 
in the last year alone, and the ambulance service facing cuts equivalent to 433 paramedics who just won't be there when you need them, or 70 ambulances being taken off the road. Yet the First Minister comes to this chamber today and claims that everything is fine with the NHS. Whether it's in his own patch or across Scotland, why is the First Minister in denial about the growing crisis in the NHS? First Minister. Well, uh, every statement I, I read out uh, earlier on uh, to Jackie Bailey was from the report itself, from the Audit Scotland uh, report. Or, or, for that matter, I could quote uh, Caroline Gardner uh, from Audit Scotland in a very reasonable and considered interview on Radio Scotland this morning. Uh, Caroline Gardner, I think it's important to say that the times that patients are waiting on average now is much shorter than they have been in the past. Oh. The Government has managed to protect the National Health Service budget, certainly the revenue budget, in real terms up until the current budget period. And we know, of course, what happened in the current budget period. To pass on the consequentials from Westminster, the National Health Service would have required an additional £202 million in its revenue budget. I agree Mr Swinney didn't do that. He put forward £288 million. So in the current budget year, we are exceeding passing on the consequential. So all of the, the facts I've stated are from the Audit Scotland report. And that guarantee of an increase in real terms funding for the National Health Service has helped it withstand the financial pressures which are undoubtedly there. No such guarantee was in place from the Labour Party in 2007. No such guarantee was in place from Ian Gray in the run-up to the 2011 election. So Jackie Bailey should really try to consider, yes, of course, there are pressures on our National Health Service. How could it be otherwise when the mall of financial control from Westminster? But how much greater would these pressures have been if we'd had the disaster of a continuation of Labour administration in Scotland? We might even have had a National Health Service in Scotland facing the same almighty pressures as prevalent in Wales under Labour control. Jackie Bailey. Presiding officer, it's evident the First Minister hasn't read the rest of the Audit Scotland report, nor has he read Labour's manifesto, which very clearly said we would, and I quote, we would protect the NHS budget in Scotland and pass on all Barnet consequentials yeah. for health. But, presiding officer, you know, it is clear after that answer that the First Minister is indeed in denial. In his world, Everything is wonderful and rosy. But whilst we wait on answers, there are people in Scotland's hospitals waiting on trolleys. There are people waiting for an ambulance turning up. There are people waiting for an NHS that Scotland needs and the people deserve. And let's look at what the experts say. The British Medical Association warned last year that this situation was not sustainable. The Royal College of Nursing today, when patient care suffers because health boards are trying to make ends meet, it's obvious something is wrong. And a paramedic said this week, we can't keep up. It's just a matter of time before something goes seriously wrong. Why does the First Minister think that the people who work in the NHS every single day are wrong about the cuts facing our health service and only he is right? First Minister. Right. Jackie Bailey mentioned that uh, delayed discharges would increase the National Health Service, but they're much less than we were when the SNP came to power. She said there were vacancies among consultants, but the number of consultants is much greater than when the SNP came to power, as indeed are the number of nurses, the number of doctors, the number of NHS staff has increased by 6.9 per cent since the SNP came to power. And these things have been achieved against the austerity from the Westminster Government. That quote from the Audit Scotland report. Reductions in spending at UK level will affect the level of funding available in Scotland. The Scottish Government will need to plan for health spending with an overall reducing budget. Isn't that exactly the kernel of a debate that we had in the recent referendum campaign, where Jackie Bailey and the Labour Party were in denial about the impact, the impact of Westminster funding cuts on the Scottish National Health Service. So if we take the Audit Scotland report as a very considered objective analysis, will Jackie Bailey accept that when Audit Scotland point out the reality that a 7% decline in revenue budgets in Scotland have a severe impact across the public sector? 
which makes it all the more laudable that the, the SNP in government have managed to protect our National Health Service. Now, as far as the Labour Party is concerned, it goes without argument. In 2007, Jack McConnell said the National Health Service would just have to cut its cloth and have no additional consequentials. And as for Ian Gray, on the 8th September 2010, on Newsnight Scotland, quote, we wouldn't ring fence the health budget. Only when they were on the run in the election campaign did they start to change their tune. Ms Bailey, Ms. Bailey I would appreciate a brief question and a brief answer if I want to get through today. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I remind the First Minister, who still remains in denial, that from 2007 to 10, the Labour government at UK level gave the Scottish government more money for the health service than you actually applied to the health service. <laughs> Presiding Officer, we, we are detecting a pattern now. Audit Scotland is wrong, the ambulance drivers are wrong, doctors are wrong, nurses are wrong. Yeah. Everybody is wrong, apart from Alex Salmond. Yeah, but the absolutely. facts are clear. The NHS is completely devolved. We make all the decisions here in Scotland and the SNP have been in charge for over seven years. In that time, bed numbers have been slashed, budgets have been cut, staffing cut, waiting times growing, delayed discharge on the rise. Does the First Minister recognise that the people of Scotland want a long-term plan for their health service, not sticking plaster solutions? They want a focus on the NHS, not endless discussions about the Constitution. First Minister, will you deliver or are you simply in denial? First Minister. <laughs> they, uh... Well, NHS staff has increased by 6.9%. That's an increase of 8,818 uh, between September 2006 uh, and June 2014. The Scottish La the National Party have protected, as we pledged to do, the National Health Service revenue budget in real terms and added to that this year. Yes, of course, there are pressures on our National Health Service. How could it be otherwise uh, prisoned within the austerity of the UK government? But I'll tell you, as far as being in denial is concerned, I quoted exactly from the Audit Scotland report about these financial pressures and bearing down on the health service. That was exactly the argument that was taking place in the referendum campaign. And Jackie Bailey appeared in a, in a picture in the, the BBC under I guess, the, the background of SNP lies in the health service. I, I saw it here and I took a screen grab of it. It's under the caption, MSP Bailey denies Labour disunity. A holiday politician has denied factions between Labour MSPs and MPs and insisted they were joined at the hip. <laughs> well, any politician with the gall to make that argument can't be trusted on the Labour Party or indeed the finances of the National Health Service. Question two, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. May I say that Joanne Lamont and I come from different political backgrounds, but I recognise her as a woman of principle and substance, and, I have always put her com and she has always put her commitment to serve above personal ambition. For me, she's the sort of public servant that we need more of in Scottish politics, and I have great cause to be grateful to her and her leadership role that she took in the Better Together campaign. Um, to, ask the First Minister, to ask the First Minister when he'll next meet the Prime Minister. First Minister. Uh, no plans uh, near future. Ruth Davidson. Reading officer, the Scottish Government won plaudits last year when it stepped in to bring Prestwick Airport into public ownership. It bought it for a pound but has since pledged £25 million to keep it afloat. A string of promises to outline Prestwick's commercial future, though, have since been broken. First of all, in February, a French consultant was brought in on a three-month contract to map out where the Government should go, and we were promised a report in the summer. In June, Nicola Sturgeon appeared before a parliamentary committee and said that a business plan would be published, and I quote, in the next couple of months. Then, a couple of months later, when the plan should have been published, Transport Scotland said that a strategic vision document outlining the future of the airport would, and again I quote, be published in October. October has one day left, so will we finally hear tomorrow, and can the First Minister tell us how it will provide a clear path, path back to private ownership? Well, can, I, can I say that uh, that strategic vision will be published in the next few days? I, I can promise her within my remaining term of office. So I can tell you that's an extremely urgent and immediate uh, commitment in that strategic vision. But listen, th this, this issue uh, is about the future of a substantial part of the Scottish, but also particularly the Ayrshire uh, economy. 
And I would ask Ruth Davidson just to think about this, because the, apart from everything else, one of the local members who's been most uh, adamant uh, and supportive of the, the government's intervention in terms of Presswick Airport, the alternative, of course, was closure of the airport. And I hope Ruth Davidson understands that. And the government stepped in because the last private sector bidder uh, was unable to carry forward. And, of course, the significant thing that broke the deal and made it unable to go forward with that private sector bidder was the impact of air passenger duty in terms of the flights from press. Well, Ruth Davison looks perplexed, but I know she has studied this issue, and that was identified by the bidder concerned as the straw that broke the camel's back in terms of the takeover of Presswick Airport. So let's not underrate the challenges in terms of building a strategic vision to keep Presswick Airport as an important part of the Scottish economy. But I can reassure her uh, that that vision will be published in the next few days. It will set forward an exciting future for Presswick Airport, but would be considerably assisted if Presswick Airport didn't have to exist with its hands tied behind its back on the imposition of the outrageous duty of air passenger duty and its impact on the carriers at Presswick Airport. Ms. Davidson. Well, I'm glad to hear that this report will finally be published. Um, and I would point out to the First Minister that we have long backed a plan to return to private ownership. And my colleague John Scott has rightly been working with people on the ground to make that happen. But what we need from this report, which will be published in the next few days, is a proper route map so that workers at Presswick and those who rely on it uh, see that there is a proper future. And we won't get that from a fudge that once again sees this government kick the can down the road. After more than a year of uncertainty, we do need this sorted for the long term now. So in that short term of office, in those final weeks in post, can the First Minister ensure that he and his deputy as Infrastructure Secretary come back to this Parliament with their clear and unambiguous plans? First Minister. Well, I, 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 I thought that uh, Ruth Davidson would know that the Deputy First Minister is going to the Parliamentary Committee on the, the 12th of uh, next month to talk about exactly this issue. Uh, so that would be important to consider. Uh, can I really, I mean, what I don't understand about Ruth Davidson's attitude to this, uh, if there hadn't been a private market failure, if we hadn't been unable to secure a private sector bid, then the airport would have closed and thousands of people, thousands of people, would have been out of work. And the industry, the aerospace, the highly successful aerospace industry around Presswick would have been placed in substantial jeopardy. I had a conversation with Howard Davis, the Tory appointee, who's looking at the prospect of where to spend 40 or 50 or 60 billion pounds on another runway for Heathrow or for Gatwick or building Boris's airport somewhere in the River Thames. And I put it to Howard Davis, that, look, if you were to reduce air passenger duty for the north of England, or give the Scottish Parliament the power to do something about it to increase the competitive position for direct international flights, then you would relieve immediately some of the pressure on the London airports. Howard Davis looked at me and said that would be a distortion of competition. Unfortunately, Ruth Davidson and her party live in a world where spending 40, 50, 60 billion pounds in infrastructure in the south of England is not a distortion of competition, but allowing airports like Presswick to survive and prosper by having a competitive rate of air passenger duty somehow is. That is the topsy-turvy world of London bias that the Conservative Party are placed in Scotland. Order. I have a number of constituency questions that are very important to the members themselves. Can I ask that their questions and answers are brief to allow me to get through as many as possible? Graham Day. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. As the First Minister may be aware, John M. Henderson, the long-established Arbroath-based engineering company, has gone into administration with the immediate loss of 89 jobs. Can I ask what action the Scottish Government is taking in response to this major blow to the economy and the affected employees, and how, in particular, it might help the tremendous efforts being made by the Angus Training Group to assist apprentices caught up in this situation find alternative opportunities to pursue their planned careers? First Minister. Well, I, I share the member's concern regarding the developments in respect of GM Henderson and the impact of this will have on the employees affected, their families and, of course, the surrounding economy. Through the, the PACE initiative, 
We have been liaising closely with the administrators, and the redundancy support event was held yesterday, Wednesday, 29th of October. That provided an opportunity for employees to speak with local agencies. 67 employees and 17 of the modern apprenticeships, uh, apprentices attended, and three MAs, I'm pleased to report, have found jobs following that discussion. I can assure the member that Scottish Enterprise and the Industry Secretary will be fully engaged uh, with, uh, as with PACE to, to try and ensure that as many as possible of this highly skilled workforce follow the, uh, that number of apprentices into secure employment as quickly as possible. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The water supply to over 50 homes in the Tummel Bridge area of Perthshire has found to be contaminated with E. coli and salmonella, presenting clear health risks to the local population. Will the First Minister undertake to speak uh, to Scottish Water and ask them to take urgent action to ensure that the long-awaited replacement water supply uh, can now be put in place without further delay, so my constituents no longer have to rely on bottled water for drinking and cooking. I will uh, today uh, uh, secure from Scottish Water a further update on the efforts they are making to secure the position of the supply in the, the members' area, and I will communicate to that to him as, as quickly as possible. Alison Johnson. Um, thank you. Can I associate the Green and Independent Group of MSPs with colleagues' comments regarding the important contribution of Joanne Lamont to public life um, in Scotland? Um, I'm sure the First Minister will share my serious concern about the loss of up to 45 jobs from the Scotsman newspaper titles, which is a huge loss to Scottish journalism and to this city. What reassurance can the First Minister provide that the government places a high value on a thriving journalism sector, and what support can it provide to local titles such as the Evening News and those who look likely to lose their jobs? First Minister. Well, uh, the government officials met with Paul Horan from the National Union Journalists uh, on uh, yesterday in the context of meeting with the STUC uh, and media-based trade unions uh, on possible submissions to the Smith Commission, and that provided us with the opportunity uh, to discuss the, the redundancies uh, at Johnston Press. So obviously, uh, each and every one of us has, uh, as public servants ha has a substantial interest in a vibrant and successful written press uh, in Scotland. Uh, we hope that the redundancies announced can be mitigated, but we hope and believe uh, that these talented journalists hopefully will find uh, secure uh, employment uh, elsewhere if that's not possible. Uh, the position of the, the Scottish press and the pressure they're under, uh, I hope that the owners and titles uh, understand that there is only so far uh, that a journalistic complement can be reduced. Uh, while maintaining the, the quality and ability uh, of journalists to reflect the, the vibrant political life of, of Scotland. Christina McKell. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. The First Minister will, will be upset as much as I am to hear that Henderson's buses in my constituency cease trading without warning to either its customers and especially its 150 staff. With potential job losses and no trade union representation at the company, can the First Minister tell me what action the Scottish Government will take to support the staff and the customers of this important company? First Minister. The, uh, the Scottish Government will implement the, the PACE initiative as quickly as possible, and can I assure the member that uh, I will be happy and willing to uh, arrange a meeting with the relevant Minister to discuss how our constituency can be protected in terms of this uh, unfortunate development. Question number three, Alison McInnes. I too uh, pay tribute to Joanne Lamont. There is no doubting her commitment to social justice, and she can be proud of her many achievements. I wish her well. Uh, to ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, a range of issues to carry forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Alice McInnes. Thank you. Last week, the Mental Welfare Commission for Scotland raised concerns about the rise in the emergency detention of young people. They also highlighted the problems caused by the admission of children to general hospital wards. Now, the Scottish Government has a policy to reduce the number of children sent to hospital wards which do not specialise in the care that they need. So can the First Minister explain why the number of children needing mental health care who were admitted to non-specialist wards actually rose last year to more than 200? First Minister. Well, I think the, the member raises an important point, and uh, I actually had a meeting yesterday which uh, touched on uh, uh, this uh, exact issue. Perhaps I can arrange a meeting with the Health Secretary so that the member can develop the point and see what the plans are in the vision for the National Health Service to get back on track in terms of reduction of, uh, of children with mental health problems admitted to general wards. Alice McKinnon. First Minister, there are growing calls for mental health to be given the same priority as physical health. When people are taken into emergency detention, this action is supposed to be signed off by a mental health officer. 
But the Mental Welfare Commission expressed concern last week that this doesn't always happen. It means we cannot be sure that children are only taken into emergency detention with this safeguard in place. I don't know if the First Minister is leaving a note for his successor, but if he is, will he make sure that mental health services for young people are on the list of things to put right? First Minister. Well, uh, happily, I, I don't have to, to leave a note. Uh, my, my successor is sitting uh, alongside me, and her interest and compassion and commitment for the National Health Service is well known uh, and well established. Uh, but uh, I think the member raises a, a serious issue, and I think it develops uh, and should be taken in that fashion. That's why I'll arrange the, the meeting I discussed so that can be pursued uh, in all its detail to, to make sure there's a an adequate reply which satisfies Alison McInnes in terms of the future direction of this highly important matter. Question four, Jimmy. Uh, to, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government is taking to reduce road accidents and casualties. First Minister. Well, uh, one life lost on Scotland's roads is one too many. The effects of, of drink driving can be shattering to families and communities. That's why we're introducing legislation to Parliament to reduce Scotland's drink drive alcohol limit from 80 milligrams to 50 milligrams for every 100 millilitres of blood, bringing Scotland into line with most other European countries. Jimmy D. Thank the First Minister for that answer. While the proposal to reduce the drink driving limit has been widely welcomed, does he agree that Scotland now has the opportunity to lead the way across the UK, not just in reducing the drink driving limit, but through additional measures such as lower limits for newly qualified and professional drivers? But in order for this to happen, this Parliament must have the further powers that are necessary so that we can save even more lives and prevent even more injuries in Scotland. First Minister. I think the, the member makes a serious and important point. We, we do welcome the fact that we now have the power which we have now used or proposed to be used for this Parliament to discuss uh, to make Scotland's roads safer through a, a lower uh, alcohol limit. Uh, that is a, a very limited uh, transfer of powers, however. The, there are major other aspects which could be part of a package of measures to bear down on this, for example, differential drink driving limits, which the member mentioned, and to decide, for example, whether it would be appropriate to give the police the power to undertake the random breath testing of, of drivers. Uh, I, I think, uh, and I was quite interested in the reaction to the initiative of the Justice Secretary earlier this week, I mean, I, I think the public mood uh, is ripe and ready for a further initiative uh, to bear down on uh, an aspect in conduct in society which still is disastrous in terms of its impact uh, on victims and communities and indeed on the perpetrators themselves and their families. Uh, uh, and therefore I hope that the, the Chamber will both support the initiatives from the Justice Secretary and will have a considered debate and discussion about the further area of powers that would be, could be secured in order to go further in this highly important matter. Question five, Neil Bibby. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on concerns regarding the impact that charging for SQA exam marking reviews could have on students. First Minister. Well, I, I know that Neil will be aware that the, the, the SQA charges, including for the results services, are not paid by pupils or parents in state schools. They are paid by the local council and quite properly. Uh, the new system is fairer than the old appeals process as it allows a, a wider range of evidence to be considered for candidates who miss an exam through illness or other exceptional circumstances. In, in both independent and public sector schools, a request should only be made if there is a legitimate query about a pupil's result based on the professional judgment of the teacher. Neil Bibby. Well, the, the First Minister will be aware that charges introduced this year means that pupils from private schools can pay up to £39.75 to appeal uh, any exam result. Yet in the state sector, not only is there variation from council to council uh, whether the school or local authority will pay for such appeals, there is also concern from parents and anecdotal evidence that these charges are acting as a disincentive to appealing for our pupils. The EIS have said this week pupils from private schools have an unfair advantage, and this is something that should not be allowed. Uh, the Scottish Parent Teacher Council have also said uh, this is an uncomfortable situation. Given these concerns, uh, will the First Minister uh, agree to contact the SQA and uh, ask for an investigation and review of the fairness uh, and the charges relating to this new system? First Minister. I'm sorry, the, Neil Bibby should understand the Association of Directors of Education have made it clear, quote, local authorities finance the cost of SQA entries. That's the ADA statement of the 10th of February eh, 2014. In state schools, the payment of SQA fees is met by the local authority. It would be wrong, entirely wrong, 
to pass on this charge to hard-pressed families. That is the position, and it should uh, remain the position under this new system, which in many aspects has a substantial advantage over the previous system. Question six, Christian Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what resources the Scottish Government has in place to assist service personnel and their families who have been affected by the conflict in Afghanistan. First Minister. Well, obviously, it's, it's responsibility uh, for supporting service personnel lies with the MOD. But despite that, the Scottish Government has a record which has been acknowledged by military and veterans organisations of delivering uh, first-class initiatives for veterans, including those who have served in Afghanistan. Uh, that includes the, the recent appointment of the Scottish Veterans Commissioner. That's the first appointment of its kind in the UK. And the now well-established Scottish Veterans Fund, delivered with our partners in Veterans, Veterans Scotland, which has provided more than £600,000 of funding uh, to veterans' organisations since 2008. Uh, I thank the First Minister for his answer. Reports this week state that the UK Government is failing to abide by its pledge in its Armed Forces Covenant to give an injured British soldiers priority for medical treatment in the years after their service. And this when Help for Heroes has estimated 75,000 service personnel could suffer mentally and physically as a result of operations in Afghanistan. What steps is the Scottish Government taking to ensure that our veterans receive the best possible care from our NHS? Well, it's right and proper that the armed forces and veterans receive world-class service through the National Health Service. We have a strong record in delivering high-quality care to both armed forces and veterans. That has been detailed in our commitments paper. A significant advantage has been made in Scotland for our veterans. There is a wide range of specialist services which are already available, a, a dedicated pathway, for example, in the National State of Art Prosthetics Service. Funding this year of £1.5 million was provided for that, as well as priority treatment for a number of service-related conditions. That strategy, the national uh, mental strategy, is also delivering a range of commitments which will benefit veterans, including faster access to psychological therapies, the continued funding of specialist mental health services for veterans in partnership with NHS Scotland and Combat Stress at £1.2 million per year. Uh, I saw an answer in the, the House Commons yesterday when there was some doubt uh, about the identification of veterans in the armed forces. Uh, I hope and believe that uh, it's not a significant problem uh, in Scotland, but we shall check to, to make sure that that is the case, because all members of this chamber uh, want to share a, a joint pride uh, in the redemption of our obligation and commitment uh, to the veterans, and I hope this whole chamber is proud of our track record as a parliament in supporting veterans and veterans' organisations. <laughs> Thank you. That ends First Minister's questions. We now move to members' business. Members who are leaving the chamber should leave quickly and quietly, and I'll give a few moments for that to happen.